Okay, we've got some new early time-restricted feeding, aka early intermittent fasting data, which just hit the scientific streets. That will give both the fanboys and the haters a reason to celebrate, which means this video will make everyone happy. Or so you'd think. Here's the cellular and metabolic impact you need to know about. Yo, yo, yo! What is up? Welcome back to another week of How to Health. My name is Kevin. I run liftinbalance.com where we take aim at all things health and longevity and do it in an odd, weird, interesting, and highly sarcastic way. Today, we are continuing the debate if eating your meals earlier in the day and doing so in a restricted, strategic, consistent window can actually move the needle when it comes to your cellular and metabolic health and thus vitality over time, aka disease prevention over time, aka, aka feeling how you're capable of feeling over time, aka, aka, aka your longevity. And if you were looking for a definite answer, please stop holding your breath. Even though strategic breath holds are good for you, it's not the time or the place because you're not going to get it here today. Although what you will get is a thorough analysis of some very interesting new data from someone who's been covering the topic and deploying it in their own life for the last seven years or so. And like I said, there are some nuggets here for people on both sides of the fasting fence with the ultimate goal being you pick something up that can help you improve your strategy and thus your health over time. Even if it's just the tidbit that breath holds can help you improve your respiratory health. Anyway, enough with the mushy stuff. Let's dive in. And the place we need to start is with a quick reminder of what early time-restricted feeding, or what I like to call circadian eating, actually is. And the notion is really quite simple. It's a energy consumption strategy, which aims to coordinate one's energy intake in stronger alignment with the way we humans have evolved eating during the day when we could see, coordinate, gather, and hunt. Coupling it with the likely extended overnight fast from sundown to sunrise, which our primate ancestors likely followed as well. A common application of this in today's world would be something like eating between the hours of 8 a.m. and 3 p.m. or 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. or even something like 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. As long as you are finishing up early and consuming all of your energy in an eight hour-ish window or less, that could be considered an early time restricted feeding protocol. And I gotta say, the science to date has been rather interesting and is certainly one of the things that has hooked me on it. With a combination of animal and human models suggesting that a strategy like this improves critical metabolic markers like insulin sensitivity and fasting glucose, boosts longevity associated gene expression, lowers inflammatory activity, and even subdues cues for hunger and appetite. And when theorizing why these effects may be taking place, researchers have suggested that it could be due to this way of eating's better alignment to the human body's innate circadian digestive rhythms to absorb and metabolize food. In other words, circadian eating, which happens to be the kind of controversial part mainly due to the fact that there haven't been many studies done to test this compelling theory. Which brings us to this new research, which happens to be the creme de la creme of experimental models, a randomized control human crossover study, which essentially means that the initial population of participants were randomly divided into an early fasting group and a control fasting group, eating carefully crafted prepared diets based on their metabolic needs for a period of nine days. And then after a brief washout period, they switched or crossed over. And the previous controls were now in the early fasting group, and those early fasters were now the standard fasting controls, giving researchers a holistic set of data that allows them to truly delineate the differences to assess the effects of an early time-restricted feeding protocol on intestinal energy and micronutrient absorption, components of energy expenditure, gastrointestinal function, and markers of cardiometabolic health compared to not 
eating early. Now, when it came to timing, the early eaters consumed all of their energy between a six hour window from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. While the control group ate the same amount of energy from the same exact meals, but did it between 8 a.m and 8 p.m. With the main question or primary outcome from researchers being, is early eating's beneficial effects really driven by our innate circadian ability to digest and metabolize energy better earlier in the day? Or is that just hogwash? And before we get to the results, there are two final important things worth knowing. First, this study was done in healthy adults consuming a controlled energy match weight maintenance diet under free living conditions. So they weren't cooped up in a room the whole time. They could have cheated. However, there was no pre-existing metabolic dysfunction, which is important. And second, this was a small study with only 16 subjects. One of the reasons being it's tough to do super controlled studies like this on a large scale. So just keep those things in mind. All right, enough with the nonsense. Let's hear it. What'd they find? First, the elephant in the room. For this study, early time-restricted feeding was found to have no impact on energy digestibility relative to the control group eating schedule. Okay. In addition, there were no differences observed in relative digestibility of fat, protein, or carbohydrates. So that right there deflates the more optimal digestion and nutrient absorption theory for this small cohort. However, I will add, previous studies have found that there is in fact an impact on this variable. So the best we can say for now is the debate continues. Sticking with the non-impact category, it was also observed that there was no significant differences in metabolized energy, resting energy expenditure, or the thermal effect of food, the majority of lipid markers, alpha and beta diversity in the microbiome, and self-reported sleep. Now, there was something else interesting, leaning towards a little concerning, found as well. And that was a significant uptick in nitrogen excretion in the urine of participants following the early time-restricted feeding protocol. Which may have you wondering, um, who cares? Well, the caring occurs when you connect that urinary nitrogen is a marker used to assess dietary protein intake. But... In this case, since dietary protein was matched between protocols, this increase in urinary nitrogen excretion may be due to increased protein breakdown from other sources like lean tissue, which we know from all of our deep dives covering our structural self's role in aging and longevity is not a good thing. So let this act as a reminder for all of those out there following a protocol which compresses your eating window with ambitions to boost cellular health and efficiency, do not skimp out on the protein. 0.8 to one grams per pound of body weight should be the goal, fasting or not, and it's not easy. Exactly why we have this video to walk you through it. With that, we move on to the findings that will make the early fasters tweet. <laughs> Told ya. Starting with self-reported hunger, which seemed to be more subdued. As the early eating groups reported less hunger, capacity to eat, and desire to eat while experiencing more fullness and overall satiety compared to the controls. Pretty interesting, right? Then we add the cardiometabolic impact, which aligned with previous studies to be significant. As the early eating protocol was shown to lower mean 24-hour glucose and glycemic variability, fasting and nighttime glucose, insulin and markers of insulin resistance, and postperennial triglycerides all measured by a continuous glucose monitor and daily blood draws, reiterating early eating cellular and metabolic disease fighting effects. The last interesting tidbit I want to share is around early time-restricted feedings, modulation of circadian genes and longevity pathways. As there was an observed increase in the AMPK, NAMPT, and CERT1 pathways, which have been previously associated with improving cellular function, cleanup, and efficiency. So overall, some interesting stuff. A little good, a little eye-opening, and a little neutral. But more importantly, 
a little more information to better tweak and adjust your own strategy, which is what it's all about while also being privy to the fact that no one study can tell the complete story. It takes a good foundation of repeatable, well-sized, well-executed studies to really build a strong association to an outcome, which this early time-restricted feeding research is still in the beginning stages of. That being said, it doesn't mean you can't or shouldn't give it a try. As I mentioned before, I've been on this train for what is coming up on a decade now, and I personally love it. Following a 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. early feeding protocol each and every day. And the reason I love it is because I have seen my personal objective data and subjective feel improve as a byproduct of it. I feel better when I eat early. My metabolic markers are consistently great. I've seen enhanced sleep metrics, including low resting heart rate, heart rate variability, total deep and REM sleep time. And as a byproduct, I like to think that I'm optimizing my nightly brain detoxification via the glymphatic system, which you can learn all about here. And because of it, I wake up more energized and can only hope that my morning workout on a 15 hour overnight fast supercharges my metabolic flexibility and cellular recycling, AKA autophagy before my nourishing refuel, which is a good segue to point out that all of this is not 100% driven by my meal timing strategy. Strategic meal timing is only a small piece in the feeling effing awesome puzzle. One which is truly optimized when you prioritize prioritize real whole nourishing foods, get consistent circadian aligned sleep, adequate outdoor and nature time, proactively manage your stress, and move your ass aka exercise on a frequent basis. As we know, there are no silver bullets when it comes to optimizing your cellular and metabolic health. Only tools in the toolbox. Tools that don't do much if you can't find a way to deploy them in a consistent manner. So that is the goal. What I just went through is what works for me and my life. And that does not necessarily mean that it is the best exact approach for you and your life. In fact, it's probably not. So your job being the owner of your health and the advocate for your feeling effing awesome over time ambitions is to figure out that right balance for you, of which early eating could or could not be part of. With that, I would love to hear from you on what your current meal timing strategy looks like and if you've given this early time restricted feeding thing a go. So drop your experience in the comments below and let me know your most eye-opening finding when it came to your health. Oh, and remember, if you don't own it, no one will. Well, no one can actually own it, except you, so you only got one choice. Go get it.